and welcome to today's webinar, Empowering Nurses to Protect Themselves and Their Patients, The Importance of Collaboration Between Nurses and Environmental Services. My name is Kate Wiedemann, and I'm a healthcare, health communications specialist at CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. The mission of CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion is to protect patients, protect healthcare personnel, and promote safety, quality, and value in both national and international healthcare delivery systems. This webinar is part of a series of infection control related webinars that CDC will, is hosting with the American Nurses Association and members of the Nursing Infection Control Education Network. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via your chat window, located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen, anytime during the presentation. Questions will be addressed after all presentations as time allows. To ask for help, please press the raise hand button, located on the top left-hand side of the screen if you need to chat with a meeting chairperson for assistance, such as for technical difficulties, during the webinar. Also, the speaker slides from today's presentation will be provided to participants in a follow-up email. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Kathleen Wiley from the Oncology Nursing Society, who will provide opening remarks. Kathleen? Hi, thank you, Kate. Um, so yes, my name is Kathleen Wiley, and I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce to you Dr. Hudson Garrett. Um, Dr. Garrett is the Executive Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer for National Association of Directors of, of Nursing Administration and Long-Term Care. Dr. Garrett brings a variety of infection prevention and control training and expertise to our topic today. He holds a dual master's in nursing and public health, a post-master's certificate as a family nurse practitioner, a post-master's certificate in infection prevention and infection control, and a PhD in healthcare administration and policy. He has completed the Johns Hopkins Fellows Program in hospital epidemiology and infection control and the CDC Fundamentals of Healthcare Epidemiology Program. He is board certified in family practice, vascular access, moderate sedation, antibiotic stewardship, infection prevention, legal nurse consulting, and as a director of nursing and long-term care. He is also a fellow in the Academy of the National Association of Directors of Nursing Administration and Long-Term Care and the American Academy of Project Management. Dr. Garrett has vast presentation experiences on topics related to infection prevention and control, especially with regard to how the environment of care may directly impact infection risk and has previously served on the Board of Directors for the Association for Healthcare Environment, a personal membership group of the American Hospital Association. And so with that, I'd really like to thank you, Dr. Garrett, for being here today. And I'll turn things over to you and, and look forward to hearing your presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And welcome to everybody on the line today. And we certainly appreciate everybody taking the time, especially on this exciting day of the solar eclipse that seems to have taken over everyone's world. Uh, this webinar was developed in collaboration with my colleagues at the American Association of Colleges of Nursing and the Oncology Nursing Society. So I want to, first of all, thank them. I do want to start with sort of a reality check and kind of setting the, the groundwork for what we're going to talk about today, which is really where we are with healthcare associated infections or HAIs. The good news is that we're making progress. Um, the opportunity for improvement is that we still have a long way to go. When we look at current evidence-based recommendations specifically for infection prevention and control, there's many, um, but they really go back to some foundational and, and, and fundamental pieces that we're going to talk about today specific to the healthcare environment. National compliance, however, is around 40-ish percent um, for full compliance with the known evidence-based recommendations. And one of the best websites I can provide for you during the context of today's program is the CDC website, which is cdc.gov forward slash HAI. That website again is cdc.gov forward slash HAI for healthcare associated infection. There you can really find a plethora of information that will help us drive standardization in practice and specifically uh, make sure that we are aware of all the current evidence-based tools and resources that the CDC and other partners have put out. Let's take hand hygiene for just a second. Well, we've got about 40% national compliance, so about 60% of the time we're really not fully 
following the evidence-based recommendations from the CDC and the World Health Organization. And then if we translate that into the topic of today, which is the healthcare environment or the clinical environment of care, whatever you may call it, there's a, a role of, of transmission that we're further understanding day by day. And in the last few years alone have been very exciting to look at some of the um, specific uh, resources. So let's start with the future of healthcare in general. And this graphic came from the Institute for Healthcare, uh, I'm sorry, for Healthcare Improvement, otherwise known as IHI, which was started by Dr. Don Berwitz several years ago. And if you look at kind of these three elements of how healthcare is changing and evolving, the first is really looking at population health management. Well, we're talking today about the healthcare environment of care. Well, that impacts not only the patients that we serve, but also our healthcare providers. And so we have to include those within our population. We can also use the clinical environment of care as a way to you know, positively or negatively um, impact the experience of care. For example, if I walk into an outpatient clinic, or I walk into a nursing ward, or I walk into an ambulatory surgery center or a long-term care facility, um, this, is, this is something that the patient's first or the, the, the family member's first experience is really going to be with cleanliness in many cases. They're going to know, are the staff friendly? Is the environment clean? I always make the analogy when I go to a restaurant for the first time, one of the first things I do is I actually walk into that restaurant bathroom and I look and I say, you know, is this environment clean? Because chances are if the bathroom is clean, then there's a good chance that the kitchen is also clean. And so that first impression around the cleanliness of the environment in our healthcare facilities also makes a big difference also. And last but not least is cost. Well, you know, that's one of those things that especially nurses don't like to talk about because cost in many cases could be FTE reductions, it could be staffing, it could be educational funds, but we want to make sure we can say there's a positive impact here because it doesn't cost more to do the right care every single time. The other thing we need to think about is how do we apply these knowledge-based things um, around the environment of care to the whole continuum of care? from cradle to grave, starting from the home environment, looking at outpatient facilities, even engaging people like pharmacists, um, urgent care, all the way through the acute care environment and the post-acute care environment, like long-term care or rehab hospitals or hospice. This is an, an opportunity for us to standardize our practices and not only our, our practices, but also our education. And I think this is something that really makes a big difference when we look at how do we actually standardize our efforts so that each single time a patient interacts with the healthcare system, regardless of where it is, they're getting that same consistent and reliable care uh, related to infection prevention. So I'd like to start with a question of, of kind of take your hat off as a healthcare provider. Um, you know, this is, this is something that I think it's hard for us to do as healthcare providers, but are all infections truly preventable? And many times when I ask this question to healthcare colleagues, they say, well, no, I don't think so, because the patient's comorbidity um, that they may have. Well, if you put your hat back on, um, you know, and you think about that, or even think about it from a patient perspective, well, the patient's expectation is that they'll come in, they'll receive care, um, and then they will actually be able to, to go home in at least the same condition in which they came in. And so it really depends on who you ask, but our goal is always going to be zero healthcare associated infections. We've got to do everything in our power to do that. And the last piece there is that the environment specifically makes a big difference. So when I think about contamination, um, I really think about the hands of the healthcare providers and even the patients, but also the clinical environment of care, especially the things that are going to touch the patient on a routine basis, things like blood pressure cuffs or pulse oximeters or anything like that. So how does transmission occur? I really like to practice the KISS uh, method, you know, keep it simple. So when I think about transmission, I, I really think of three general buckets. Um, the first and foremost is that the contaminated hands, and, and we've historically focused on us as the healthcare team. We measure compliance with the healthcare team, um, but now we can expand that to look at the patients and their families as well. Right behind that, though, the second source is really the contaminated environmental surfaces, those things that we're going to call non-critical items or surfaces, environmental surfaces, and even some medical devices like glucometers. And the last is, is the, the contaminated skin of the patient. Uh, we want to have the patient's skin as intact as possible because that skin serves as that most natural barrier for infection prevention and control. And so when you insert a catheter or do any type of procedure with a scalpel, for example, we're gonna break that natural barrier. And so if you look on the kind of right and left, you'll see that the way, of course, to address contaminated hands is good thorough hand hygiene, uh, 
um, from contaminated environmental surfaces that they're cleaning and disinfection, which is really the bulk of what we'll talk about today. And for contaminated skin, we need to make sure we get those indwelling catheters out and focus on good skin and asepsis. So one research question that I think is important is really what role does the clinical environment of care play in the transmission of healthcare-associated infections? Well, this is more and more understood day by day. I think 10 years ago, we could have really never had this webinar and been able to focus on some of these core topics. Uh, with the great work that the CDC has done with some of their epicenter research, we're seeing more and more progress being made about understanding the role of the environment, but also how we play into the environment as the healthcare provider team. Well, think about a time when you've traveled, um, and, and I travel every week for work, and so it's a natural phenomenon for me, but I go through the airport process, and I look at all the systems, and I look at all the redundancy, and I look at TSA, and then I get through and I go to my gate, and I think about the rigorousness that is around the FAA process as well. Well, if you apply that to healthcare, and you think about healthcare-associated infections, let's just take an airplane, for example. Let's say there's an accident and maybe a tire blows or there's a safety incident, well, the NTSB immediately investigates. And not only do they investigate, but then they share those findings with all of the airline industry. It's, it's not a competitive situation. Well, I think that's an opportunity for us to learn in the healthcare sector. So how do we protect those most vulnerable patients like our infants that are pictured there, our healthcare team, as well as our patients and their families? You know, how do we come together and share some of those learnings? And that's really the purpose of the NICE network. So what's the ideal situation? What are we trying to accomplish? I think we always need to focus, especially in nursing, around the why. What is it that we're trying to make as our objective? Well, we're not trying to make a germ-free zone. We're not trying to make a sterile environment. Even in the operating room, everything is not sterile. While the supplies may come in sterile, we may set up a sterile field and try to follow sterile technique, the entire room is not sterile. The, the skin is not sterile, nor would we want it to be. And so what we're trying to do is remove those pathogenic, so, uh, pathogenic sources of infection, prevent transmission, and, and really inhibit their ability to uh, become colonized on environmental surfaces. This will allow us to perform um, safer procedures each and every time. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a case study that I think is so pertinent to thinking about things through that critical thinking lens that we all have to do as, as nursing professionals. Well, the, let's just take this into account. An ICU patient that was 62 years old was admitted from the ED with severe sepsis, and the total length of stay was about 42 days. And so you can kind of draw that mental picture in your head. So the patient's ventilated, got multiple IV lines, has had multiple rounds of IV antibiotics, and multiple surgeries. Well, just in this one case example, there were 52 unique environmental surfaces and medical devices. And so that's a lot of things just for one patient to take care of. Well, if you take it a step further, look at all of the different people that come together from that interdisciplinary care team to deliver the safe care of this patient. So you've got nurses and physicians and mid-level providers and pharmacists and nursing assistants and environmental services. Um, one of the things that totally gets under my skin as a healthcare provider is sometimes our, our kind of siloed effect. And one of the examples that I think we have an opportunity and kind of a call to action to think about today is changing and transforming the word housekeeper to environmental services technician. Um, I think that makes such a big difference because when I think of the word housekeeper, I think it may be someone that comes and professionally cleans my home or someone who's in a hotel that comes in and takes care of the linens and throws out the trash and cleans the restroom, but there's really not a lot of specialized training associated with that. In today's complex healthcare environment, we're seeing more and more training required of our environmental services technicians. And certainly as professional nurses, you have tremendous amounts of training. So how do we come together and collaborate? I think the top question I get asked as it relates to the clinical environment of care is who should clean what and why is that the rationale? And my answer is always pretty simple. If it's connected to the patient, it really is the best practice to have the clinical care provider, whether it's a nurse or a CNA, clean that device or clean that surface so that we don't interfere with anything like a ventilator or IV pumps. Um, and anything that's not connected to the patient is really the, the responsibility of environmental services. Now, that doesn't take into account things that happen during the middle of the day, where maybe you go in to deliver care as a nurse and you find that a surface is, is soiled and you can't find environmental services, and certainly we all want to pitch in and collaborate there. But the reason I share this example is it talks about not only the complex nature of the surfaces and the devices, but also the people, because I think we've got to look at both.
Now this is a, a typical picture of a regular maybe med surge room here, but look at all of the different surfaces. Um, you know, the wheelchair is a perfect example. I recently was in a hospital and, and it was interesting to see the kind of dynamics as I was sitting there waiting for a friend to be discharged and I'm watching these wheelchairs come out one after one after one. And I, I finally walked up to one of the transporting professionals and I said, how often do you actually clean these? And she looked at me and she said, well, why do you ask? And I said, well, I'm just curious if these ever get cleaned between patients. And she said, well, we never really thought about that. And I thought to myself, well, this is an opportunity for education. And so I kind of made it a point to, to go speak to some of their colleagues and said, you might want to look at doing a cleaning and disinfection protocol around this so that we can really improve um, our practices. And that's an opportunity where the staff did want to do the right thing. They just didn't know what the right thing was. And so when we look at nursing and environmental services collaboration, we want to make sure that we think together. We're not functioning in silos and we're addressing the complexities of the healthcare environment of care as a team. This is one of the best graphics that I can think of. And while it's a little bit old back from 2001, it is simply amazing to look at how the, the environment itself can actually facilitate transmission. And so if you look at these contaminated surfaces that in this example are contaminated with VRE, they're marked by those green X's. And you can see how many different sites are culture positive here. And this is, you know, a, a room that's been terminally cleaned, ready for occupation by the next patient. And this is why we see the significant risk for, you know, patient A to have a multidrug resistant organism and then transmit it to the next patient after the first one is discharged. And so it's not only an environmental cleanliness uh, thing that we have to think about, but it's also how do we make sure that staff are appropriately trained not to touch equipment, for example, with gloves or to, to work in, in, with environmental services collaboratively so that we're functioning as a team. One of the things that I think helps show success is when you walk into example for an ICU and you see that whiteboard up there and it says your physician is, your nurse is, your pharmacist is, your technician, nursing technician is, it should also say your environmental services technician is as well because that person, while not delivering clinical care, is certainly part of the clinical care team. And it's an opportunity to make sure they feel integrated into the things that we do to protect the patient. Um, there's been some recent analysis looking at how much time environmental services, for example, spends with patients. And that opportunity could have been missed for interacting with them in a way that positively impacts our HCAP scores. So it's not just a, a patient safety perspective, but it's also a patient engagement and satisfaction opportunity to give us a way to work together as nursing and environmental services to improve that patient experience in general. Well, let's think about an example where it didn't go so well. Um, you know, these, these graphics come from the fungal meningitis outbreak that many of us may be familiar with um, from several years back. And this was a terrible, um, I guess, example, if you will, of where contamination can come into play. Sometimes where greed can come into play, where people are trying to mass produce different types of medications and they don't have the right environmental controls. Um, and in this particular case, there was a contamination of, of an actual medication uh, done at a compounding pharmacy that, that medication was then shipped out outside of the state and unfortunately had negative impacts on, on many patients and unfortunately a few deaths. And so it's an opportunity to remind us that we need to be grounded in the science and also follow those evidence-based recommendations regardless of the practice in which we serve. Um, so it doesn't matter where our environment is, we still have to adhere to that. And the way I always think about healthcare is it doesn't matter you know, where it's delivered, it's still healthcare. So if I'm in a blood mobile, I have the same expectation of safety as I would in an acute care environment. There are a few infection control imperatives that I think are pertinent to today's conversation. You know, one of the ones that I like to spend the majority of my time on, and I think that we all would look at this the same, is preventing the microorganism in the first place. Um, one of the things that CDC has done a tremendous job of is really improving antibiotic resistance um, rates and really looking at better stewardship programs and actually sharing some of those resources. You know, that helps us reduce things like Clostridium difficile or C. diff as we call it. It really gets ahead of some of the issues that we could potentially have. The next step is really looking at contamination. So how do we remove those organisms from the clinical environment of care to improve overall um, cleanliness of the environment? And of course we do that through cleaning and disinfection. Then if we keep going down the spectrum, we're really gonna to get to the point where we have to stop transmission. So really the first two have not been successful. So now we're at the point of preventing transmission. And that's really where the use of personal protective equipment comes in. If you're not familiar with the proper use of PPE, I would refer you to the CDC isolation guidelines, which are also available on the website that I provided earlier. 
each of the Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee guidelines that CDC publishes are available free of charge on that website. And I would highly recommend, even if you're not in a true infection prevention role, but you know, for nurses in general, it's helpful to know that. Um, and recently released with their new core practices that really focus on us as the healthcare team to make sure that we can provide the best possible patient care. And last but not least is really looking at how do we recognize more quickly the infection. Um, there have been amazing developments in rapid diagnostics to help us facilitate better recognition of infection. And that is just so promising because it allows us to have a more formal active surveillance program, get a better idea of monitoring, and we're going to talk about some of the environmental specific monitoring techniques that are available at the conclusion of today's program. So just keep that in mind that there's really those four imperatives. We want to spend more time, if we can, on preventing microorganisms and certainly contamination so that we don't have to run around and actually prevent transmission. Superbugs, multidrug resistant organisms, whatever you like to call them, they are always going to provide for a level of surprise because they're going to really be kind of uh, geared towards the survival of the fittest. And you think about things like MRSA or C. difficile, as we talked about earlier. One of the newer organism classes is CRE, but it really takes all of us in order to reduce the risk associated with these. And, and I tell staff all the time, it's not just about the patient, um, it's also about us. We also don't want to take home any of these superbugs. And I think of healthcare laundered uh, scrubs as an example. You know, there's a reason that that, that, that standard exists from ARN, um, because there's a lot of evidence that suggests that, you know, that's a much more evidence-based approach to reducing the risk for transmission for us as well with the healthcare textiles. The same standards exist with the healthcare environment. This is a reason that we really talk so much about proper cleaning and disinfection. And while nobody went to nursing school to learn how to clean a room, it is definitely part of our responsibility as professionals to make sure that we keep that environment as clean as possible, not only for the patient's safety and well-being, but also for us. We don't want to contaminate ourselves either. So when you think about the prevention of transmission versus the prevention of the pathogen, we focus so much, especially in the environment, around transmission-based things like cleaning, disinfection, the use of personal protective equipment, even some of these new novel technologies like UV or fogger devices that we'll talk about a little bit later really focus on the prevention of the transmission. And so it stops transmission or reduces transmission to a safer level. If we focus a lot more efforts on the pathogens, like I mentioned before, and get ahead of some of the root causes of that, um, it really helps us think about don't fix the, you know, or throw a product into the mix, but really address the process. And the way I think about it, just to keep it simple, is I think about a, a bleeding wound, right? And you apply pressure and it doesn't stop, and maybe you elevate the wound and it doesn't stop, and you still have a bleeding wound. Well, you can either go straight to a tourniquet, or you can look at how do I stop that with maybe some new technologies, and there's different ways to approach that. When we think about the application to the clinical environment of care, we're starting with those basic things, like making sure the environment's clean, keeping the trash out of the room, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, and then we might move to more objective technologies, which we'll address um, in today's program as well. Another factor to consider is colonization versus infection. Well, you know, if you think about that iceberg effect, which is, is detailed here, the top are the people that are infected, the, the folks that are symptomatic, that we actually can physically understand um, are actually infected, and they have signs of infection. So these are pretty easy folks to recognize. The challenge is, is that we have patients that are colonized that actually carry these organisms within their body and we simply don't know. So especially for those of you that might be dialing in today from the outpatient environments or we have many nursing faculty on the line as well, we need to think about the general population. Well, colonization does not always equate to infection, but it certainly is a risk factor that we need to think about. This is why you see with certain procedures there's a decolonization process that may take place based on the surgeon's preference or evidence-based recommendations to decolonize those patients prior to high-risk surgeries. And so this is a science that's continuing to be evaluated. This does not just apply, however, to the people. We can also see colonization of organisms on environmental surfaces where they serve as kind of reservoirs for transmission or microbial growth. And some of the organisms that we've talked about and will talk about can actually survive on environmental surfaces for months at a time. Um, undisturbed, and so that's why it's so important to make sure this collaboration between environmental services and nursing exists. A couple pathogens of significance that I wanted to address in today's program, we're really looking at ESBLs, or extended spectrum beta-lactamases, CRE, or your carbapenem resistant organisms, multidrug resistant bacteria, fungal organisms like candida, 
And then some of the new novel viruses that we find out there are, are ones of, of concern. And let's use Ebola as an example. Well, when Ebola hit, there was a massive response from our colleagues at CDC, right? But there was also some questions that came up from environmental services saying, well, is the product that we use in our, in our building actually effective against Ebola? And as you can imagine, no one wants to test Ebola to say is effective against a particular cleaner or disinfectant. And so what CDC did was they collaborated with colleagues at EPA that approved these types of products, looked at the microbiology of the organism, and then made an evidence-based recommendation for cleaning and disinfection. And so you're not going to see these novel pathogens that are extremely pathogenic and highly transmissible be listed on environmental um, agents' uh, product labels. You're just not going to see that for uh, reasons for safety, but you can always go to the EPA and CDC for guidance on that. When we look at the CDC guidelines for disinfection and sterilization in healthcare settings, the majority of what we're using in healthcare in many cases is, is really a non-critical item. And certainly we have other items like surgical instruments or endoscopes um, or laryngoscopes that are used in different parts of healthcare, but today we're going to focus on non-critical items. These are the items that come in contact with intact patient skin but do not contact a mucous membrane or a sterile body cavity. And so the contamination is really by the repeated use between patients. You know, perfect examples of these include things like blood pressure cuffs or pulse oximeters or stethoscopes, um, medication trays or carts are things that can become contaminated. And what, again, we're focusing on how do we reduce the risk between every single patient. And the best way I can always tell people is when in doubt, just disinfect between. And that's always going to give us kind of that safety zone because we're always hitting it with our EPA registered disinfectant in accordance with the CDC guidelines. We also want to make sure that we visibly inspect equipment, especially as nursing professionals, that we're looking for signs of deterioration or corrosion or anything like that, because with repeated use of disinfectants can also come environmental breakdown. And so when you have that breakdown, the device itself can become compromised and, and become a reservoir for transmission. There are different levels of disinfectant approvals that we need to consider. Um, and again, we're really going to focus on two today. I'll start at the very bottom, though, for purposes of kind of giving some clarity. A sanitizer is a chemical that's designed to reduce bacteria down to what's called a safe level. And so you're going to find that these are, are used in the food service industry. So you're not going to see sanitizers used in clinical areas. But for purposes of non-critical items, as I just went over, you're going to be using low-level or intermediate-level disinfectants. These are going to cover organisms all the way up through the classification of microbacterium. A perfect example of this class of organisms is tuberculosis. And while I want to make clear that we're not concerned about transmission of TB on an environmental surface, it is a benchmark organism because it's difficult to inactivate. And so that's why in many cases you'll see microbacterium as kind of a benchmark there um, to do that. High-level disinfectants um, are a high, uh, kind of a hot area right now, as we all know, especially those of us that may work in a hospital or an ambulatory surgery center. Um, and if you're accredited, this is certainly a hot button. But we're really looking for best practices with high-level disinfection, and that not only includes the physical task, but also the training of the staff associated with that. And so, again, we're really focusing today on intermediate level and low-level disinfectants. Disinfection principles that we need to be familiar with. Well, there's a kind of a misnomer. People throw the word cleaning and disinfection around interchangeably. And cleaning is simply the removal of bio burden. It's, it's not going to actually inactivate or kill anything. We really rely on the disinfection process in order to do that. And again, if you think about it, intermediate level disinfectant, that's going to be even more um, appropriate and more efficacious than a low level disinfectant. But with that process, we need to have some type of monitoring. And so we're going to talk in just a second about opportunities for environmental monitoring programs and how they can be really simple or really complex. And I'm going to start with the really simple ones and the ones that are extremely effective and economical that you can consider for your practice. Um, I think that makes a big difference for us to consider. So this is a, a kind of a hodgepodge of different pictures. Um, but you can see on the top left, you've got an ultrasound machine. You've got electronic medical records or computers on wheels. You've got a computer keyboard. Um, you've got a glucometer as well. And so it makes a big difference when you think about um, the opportunities for potential contamination. Um, one of the things that you want to think about is how do you make something that's universally applicable for cleaning and disinfection? Well, you need to work with biomedical engineering. 
you need to make sure you work with electronic medical records. You want to work with glucometers as well. And then also look at um, the nursing profession and specifically the tools that we use so that we can make sure we have something that's consistent. One of the things that I see as an opportunity for improvement for us is that in many cases, we see environmental services doing one thing and you see nursing doing another. And we need to come together and collaborate as departments and say, how do we make sure we take care of the environment consistently so that we have that high reliability um, uh, safety net that we are all looking for? There's a couple claims that are specific for healthcare disinfection. And I want to add a caveat to this that my expectation is not that a regular bedside clinician is going to memorize or know this, but we want to work collaboratively with environmental services leadership and your infection preventionist in order to make sure that the products that you're using to take care of the clinical environment of care do have these claims. So let's start with the bacteria. Um, the first is what we call broad spectrum. So we want to make sure we have effic uh, efficacy against gram positive and gram negative bacteria, enveloped and non-enveloped viruses, multidrug resistant organisms. Uh, one of the things that I'll add here is kind of a caveat of wisdom is that if you kill MRSA, then you're already going to take care of Staph aureus. And so when you have that resistant form of a particular pathogen, then you're going to have um, the same uh, non-resistant form. And so it's not necessary to have both. Pathogen fungal organisms are becoming more of a concern in the clinical environment of care, specifically things like candida. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're thinking about that, not only from a disinfection standpoint, but also think about that with the impact to the patient, because we know that antifungal treatment certainly comes with its own host of risk um, associated with treatment for the patient. Bloodborne pathogens are required by federal OSHA law, and so you need at a minimum uh, HIV or hepatitis B virus. So that's abbreviated HBV, and preferably you want to have hepatitis C virus. And of course, there's been some exciting treatment um, and cures associated with hepatitis C virus, so we're making a lot of progress in that front. And last but not least, I just wanted to mention again the importance of knowing about emergent pathogens. Um, because, again, you're not going to see those reflected on your disinfectant labels. This also applies to things like hand hygiene agents as well, because they're simply not going to test against that. But there are a couple different ways that we can look for the proper way to choosing a disinfectant method related to non-critical items. One of the things I think we have to start with is the safety. Um, if it's not going to be safe for us, safe for the patient, and safe for the environment, it's a, no, a non-starter. We're just going to stop there and we're going to move on to a different type of solution. We also want to look at what specifically are we going to clean and how often. Again, if an item is used between patients, so if I have a Dynamap, for example, and I'm pushing it down the hall and I'm going to use it between multiple patients all day long to assess vital signs, or another example that's been you know, heavily implicated in outbreaks is glucometers and lancing devices. Um, that is certainly a high-risk device because of the potential exposure to blood and body fluids. And so if I'm going to clean that every single time, what is that approved disinfectant by that manufacturer from a compatibility standpoint is another factor we have to think about. And then, you know, what's the ease of use? How quickly can I do it? Um, for example, if somebody, come, uh, you know, I guess commented, um, this was a few weeks ago, and he said, well, what if you had something that was, was literally made of gold and it would inhibit bacterial growth for a year? And I said, well, what's the catch? And, and of course, the catch was cost. And, and so you have to think about what's that trade-off between the benefit to the patient and us and the potential cost, as well as unintended consequences. One of the things that I think we have to consider with these more um, antimicrobial impregnated surfaces where the, the antimicrobial is actually embedded in it is, you know, what's the potential impact to the culture of the, of the organization? Is my environmental services team going to continue to clean that surface if they know that that surface should in some aspects inhibit microbial growth. And so that's something that I don't really think we have enough literature on to fully understand the unintended consequences. Another factor is really looking at the impact of multi-drug resistant organisms in general. And CDC put out an amazing study that really kind of did a cross section of the different types of organisms looking at all the medical records that they could access. And they found that over 2 million infections or illnesses were attributed back to these particular superbugs, if you will, and 23,000 deaths. If you then carved out of that, just C. difficile alone, 250,000 illnesses and 14,000 deaths. And when I saw that, I was alarmed but not surprised because we certainly know that one of the biggest risk factors for C. difficile infection is overuse of antibiotics. So not only do we need to address it from a clinical environment of care,
to stop transmission by doing good evidence-based recommendations with cleaning, disinfection, and personal protective equipment. We need good rapid diagnostics to identify it, and we need a prevention strategy that starts with prescribers as well as patients to, in order to really knock down this potential resistance that can impact the community. Um, I frequently mention uh, in talks that I give that you know, antibiotics are one of the few classes of medications that I can think about that truly have a community impact. You know, I've since amended that to say that now opioids also have an impact as well, um, given what we're seeing in the news lately and just the, the literature in general. So there was a great graphic that CDC put out that looked specifically at antibiotic-resistant infections in healthcare. Now, when you think about today's topic of the environment of care, we're really focusing in on that middle bucket, the one that's green that says prevent bacteria from spreading. So we're starting with our hand hygiene agents, we're using our personal protective equipment, and we're also looking for outbreaks. We want to make sure we work uh, collaboratively with our infection preventionists and our epidemiology staff to make sure that we're looking aggressively for this. On the left and the right, you'll see additional measures like getting catheters out. Don't use catheters unnecessarily, especially after surgery. You know, I have a friend that was undergoing a very, very outpatient procedure that was going to be very quick, 30 minutes in and out of the OR, and they wanted to put a Foley catheter, and, and it, it was not even indicated. And so only when we questioned that did they actually say, well, we don't really have to have it. It's just convenient. And so we need to make sure that patients feel empowered and safe to speak up to us and ask questions as well. That's one of the most important aspects we have with improving accountability with uh, applying these evidence-based recommendations. And last but not least is getting better with antibiotic use. Um, and I think that starts with us. I, I, I've yet to go to an audience where people say, I always take my antibiotic as indicated. It just, it just doesn't happen. I mean, people either forget, they stop taking it because they feel better, or worse yet, they share it. And so there is an impact that's associated with that. The holistic aspects of antibiotic use, well, how do we translate the learnings here with we know we can create a problem to the clinical environment? Well, while we may not use um, antibiotics on the environment, we do use antimicrobials in the form of disinfectants and cleaners. And so we need to educate all of the associated now so that we don't run into that same issue um, as we move forward in the next coming years where we start to see resistance with that aspect. Um, in the very center of this graphic, you'll find the public health department, and certainly CDC really serves as a conduit for sharing uh, data, but also helping drive evidence-based practices and applying them to all of the, the kind of spectrum of healthcare delivery. No more are the days where we can focus just on acute care because we know that these organisms can really transfer and they can go with the patient. So if you've got somebody that comes in from a nursing home, they go into the emergency department and they go into the OR, then maybe they go out for rehab and then go back to the nursing home. Well, that's multiple different sites that we need to make sure work together. And, and part of it starts with building a relationship up front so that we have that more coordinated approach that's going to help us drive practice standardization. And environmental services and nursing, while they don't necessarily prescribe antibiotics, do share some drug expertise. And if you think about it from the nursing perspective, well, you're one of the, the, the top advocates for the patient, the most trusted profession um, in, in the United States. Well, there's a reason for that, because the patient trusts you. And so demonstrating that you're thinking about the impact of, of unnecessary antibiotics is going to help in, in having that conversation with the prescriber. If we flip the switch to the environmental services world, while they don't use antibiotics, again, they use antimicrobials. And so there's a key opportunity there to make sure that we can actually reduce the risk associated with the use of these chemicals or medications and use them, um, you know, in, in the right uh, aspect. One of the best resources I stumbled upon several years ago was this program called Partnering to Heal. Um, I, I think that this program is something that is, has been underutilized because, honestly, I, I literally just stumbled upon it, like I said, but it's available on the Department of Health and Human Services website. Um, I've included the link at the bottom so you'll be able to click that once you get the slide presentation from uh, the program, but I highly, highly recommend that you use it for both environmental services as well as nursing personnel and anybody in healthcare, because not only does it help us actually understand the routes of transmission, and it gives not only it pictorially, but also kind of from an audio standpoint, but it truly talks about the impact of an infection to the entire team, from the patient to their family members to the provider team. And I have watched it hundreds of times, and I've used it hundreds of times for training, 
and I never get the same reaction from anybody. It is just amazing to see the diversity in people that just literally shut down, people that become emotional, people that say, wow, I've never even thought about it like that, and it's totally free. And so I would invite you to use this resource to supplement some of the great training that comes out from CDC so that you can use this to actually train your staff. There are three um, elements for the environment of care that I wanted to focus on as we get ready to, to open it up for Q&A here um, in a few minutes. But the first thing that we want to do, we talked about earlier, we want to look at safety. Is this going to be safe for the clinician and the patient? And that is not a conversation that can happen within a silo of just nursing, just environmental services, just patient safety, or, or just medicine. We've got to do it together. We've got to make sure that everybody that's affected is engaged and understands. One of the biggest citations I see with accreditation bodies is that staff don't know how to use what they have. And so if someone walks up, for example, to a nurse and says, what's the contact time for that disinfectant you're using? Or what's the contact time? How long do you have to use that hand hygiene agent? And if they don't know the answer to that question, that's a problem. Just as we're expected to know drug information, we need to make sure we know the antimicrobials that we're using both on the environment as well as the skin um, to use them safely and according with the manufacturer's instructions for use. The second is efficacy. We talked about that earlier. We're looking for how do we build broad spectrum interventions here? Gram positive and gram negative bacteria, your envelope, non enveloped viruses, bloodborne pathogens, pathogenic foreign organisms, and the like, and your multi drug resistant organisms. We want broad spectrum because it helps us cover the gamut of things that we're going to see on environmental surfaces. If you're not familiar with what is actually on environmental surfaces, there's a couple ways to, to understand that. You can either culture the environment, you can look at things like ATP measurement, which we'll talk about in a second. Or you can also look at the facility's antibiogram and make a determination as to types of cultures that you're actually seeing in the facility in the patients. And, and then look at what you're also finding in the environment and do a comparison. So there's a lot of different ways that require, again, collaboration, not just with nursing and environmental services, but also with our infectious disease colleagues, infection preventionists, as well as the medical laboratory and pharmacy. And last but not least is compatibility. Um, it's great to have efficacy and it's great to have safety, but if it's not compatible with the piece of equipment or it's not going to be compatible with the environment, then it's not, it's not going to be, be able to move forward because we've got to make sure that equipment and people are taken care of. Um, and that way we can make sure we don't have any breakdown. So earlier I talked about C. difficile, and then we talked a little bit about the proactive nature of how we can actually address that. Well, we focus so much on antibiotic uh, stewardship to reduce the risk of resistance and improve overall health, and there's some great efforts going on with that, and that really kind of covers the class of medications. What I'd like to propose is also looking at antimicrobial stewardship so that we can look at what are the, the things that we're using, are we using them according to the manufacturer's instructions, are we monitoring the environmental cleanliness, are we also training the staff? Um, one of the things that I always find funny is that people say, well, I'm, you know, I'm educated. And I think, well, are you educated or are you competent? And there's certainly a difference between those. So how do we make sure that we're not only educating people about the clinical environment of care, but we're also making sure they're competent to perform the unique aspects of their role? While I don't expect a nurse to ever get down and clean the floor or, you know, know how to do every aspect of that role or environmental services certainly to be able to do what nursing does, we do want to have some basic understandings and, and things that we collaborate on so that we can really focus on improving patient overall care, improving the experience, and really maintaining a clean and sanitary environment. Now, there's two different buckets that I like to, to put things in, and again, I try to keep it really simple. There's our core measures, the things that we should do as a team, environmental services and nursing, and then there's things that are really more adjunctive technologies, the things that we should consider doing, especially when we don't have success after fully implementing our basic things. So the first things we've, we've talked about today, we've talked about cleaning, we've talked about disinfection, and we've talked about environmental monitoring, and I'll show you a specific example um, uh, in just a few slides, actually, that will address that. But what we have not talked about is, let's say you do all of those things and you've got 100% compliance. Well, what happens when you still have ongoing transmission linked back to the environment? Well, that's when some of these new novel technologies might be of consideration. Um, you can see UV light is listed there. There's some gas and fogging solutions, other novel technologies that will come out in your antimicrobial environmental surfaces that actually have the antimicrobial embedded into the surface as well. Again, I'm always going to focus on the left side of the screen because that's where my biggest bang for my buck is. 
And I, you know, my policy is don't address problems with a product, address it by fixing the process. What we're looking for and what CDC is building is sustainable tools. How do we make sure we have a sustainable infection prevention and control program? Well, a big aspect of that is investing in our people. So it's not just products, it's really how do we actually use what we have available to us and do we use it to its fullest advantage? So I think that's something to think about. A couple of special environments that we need to think about. Well, I cannot think of the last time I went into a NICU anywhere in the United States, and I travel all the time, where I got into a NICU without being forcibly stopped if I was not washing my hands. Um, and I think that's an amazing thing. Uh, what I'd love to get to is a world where it's almost like TSA, where if I come into the hospital, I have to go through the metal detector or the hand hygiene station, as we would call it, to actually enter the facility, and then I do the same practice when I leave. Um, and it, then apply that across all of healthcare. You know, certain patients have higher risk, like our oncology population. Um, you know, that's really where the Oncology Nurses Society comes in to look at specific recommendations for taking care of these immunocompromised patients. Our neonates are no different because they really don't have that robust immune system, and these are helpless patients. They rely on us to be their total advocates. You've also got certain situations in the operating room in that perioperative environment where we want to make sure that we're minimizing the amount of people that are coming in and out of the environment. We're giving our environmental services or our surgical te technologists enough time to actually clean and disinfect that room between cases and then doing a good terminal clean um, at the end of the day. And then our intensive care patients in long-term care, where there's different complexities associated with that. In intensive care, you've got lots of equipment. In long-term care, that's their home. And so they're going to have all kinds of stuff in their environment that in many cases we cannot easily remove because it again is their home. And so that's something that we need to be considerate of. Well, let's translate that into oncology patients as an example. You've got to think about the air. You've got to make sure that you're focusing on environmental cleanliness and that's being done routinely. These patients cannot afford a single slip up. Sometimes we have to cohort patients. And this is really where you go back to the CDC isolation guidelines to look at what are those kind of like routes of transmission maybe norovirus and C. difficile, for example, because they're both fecal oral. Um, maybe if you have a respiratory pathogen and you don't have private rooms, you know, certainly it would be ideal for all facilities to have private rooms, but we still have um, situations where you do have to cohort them. So that's where collaborating with your infection preventionists can happen. We want to have the right staffing mix. And while there's no formal recommendation for this, um, we know that we want to minimize the, the, the route for transmission being the staff member in general. And so if you've got a staff member that's taking care of three patients on isolation and one that's not, that's really not the ideal situation. So we want to try to limit the staff role in transmission as well. And part of that is educating ourselves, educa educating the patients. Um, there's many facilities that are moving away from contact precautions for things like MRSA. Part of it's due to cost, part of it is due to impact, and they're really focusing on some of those better standard precautions. Um, but you know, each facility has to look at this and say, where are we on our journey? so that we can improve overall patient satisfaction. There are many different environmental monitoring aspects out there that can contribute to the development of a program, but remember the goal of our environmental monitoring program is, is very simple. We want to make sure that we're following our process and that we're achieving the efficacy that we desire. So the, the most basic and free is visual, where we're walking around, it's leadership by rounding, we're walking around watching staff clean rooms, get in there and clean a room with them. Um, bring environmental services in while you're taking care of a patient and have a conversation and focus on what are we going to do in this particular room? How are we going to make sure that we, um, you know, keep, keep these um, things clean as possible? The next is bioluminescence, which is extremely uh, economical. You can go out and buy kits from 10 to $50 online. Um, they have uh, a gel or a powder, and then you use a black light that allows you to illuminate surfaces and look for not only environmental surfaces, but you can do it on the hands to specifically look at areas missed. Again, not 100% um, foolproof, but it really allows us to have a basic idea of where cleanliness is. But you want to make sure you don't tell staff the surfaces that you're going to actually um, swab so that they're not going to make those the cleanest and then everything else is not. And one of the newer technologies that's been brought over from the food service industry is actually ATP monitoring or adenosine triphosphate. This is a quick um, barometer of success that tells you the measure of bowel burden on an environmental surface, and so it gives you a digital readout in about 15 seconds. Um, the meters themselves can range from 800 to, I've seen them up to $1,300, and a test you can do for under, under, you know, in some cases a buck, up to $2. And so it's not extremely cost prohibitive, but it's a great resource uh, 
not necessarily for the bedside nurse, but specifically for nursing administration and environmental services and infection prevention and control to walk by and actually look at how clean is the environment. And of course, our goal is to get to zero as a reading. We want to have no bioburden present on there. The limitations with ATP, though, it doesn't tell you what it is, so you're not going to know if it's a bacteria or a virus. You just know if there's bioburden present there. And of course, we want to try to get as close to zero as possible. And then consider some of the new novel technologies that we talked about today, which we unfortunately don't have time to go into into detail, but it helps us look at our compliance and, and make sure that we're moving to that needle towards zero healthcare associated infections. Earlier, I talked about the importance of, of training and staff education and building competency and awareness. And so I'd like to finish up with a few slides on that that focus in on what we can do to improve the people aspect, which I think is really the most important. The first is when we hire you and annually, we need to make sure we train you and provide those competencies, give you the documentation for all of the tools that are going to be used in your practice. And when I think about kind of core elements of, of required training, I want to know when to use it, why to use it, and how to use it. And that includes things like maybe personal protective equipment, how do I dispose of it, and God forbid, what do I do if I have a first aid incident where maybe I get a chemical in my eye? And that's where the safety data sheet, which is an OSHA requirement, comes in there. And last but not least is that it's not good enough just to do this annually. I know for myself, if I don't use something, it is gone from my brain in 90 days. And so those periodic refreshers and making sure that we're testing in different aspects, in different ways, modalities, um, competency makes a big difference. I happen to be somebody who's visual, so I like to see it. If you tell me in, in kind of an audio format, I have no idea. It goes right out of my brain. But if I see it and I write it and I do it, I have it and I can commit it to memory. I guess that's why when I drive somewhere, if I drive, I can get back there without GPS. If I sit in the back seat, I have no clue how I got there, and so that periodic refresher makes a big difference. And then how do we build the next wave of clinicians, both nursing and environmental services, to make sure that we actually have the right mix for tomorrow's clinician? Well, part of that is starting with our nursing faculty. And so that's why we you know, collaborated with the American Association of Colleges of Nursing and have Dr. Garcia on the line to really look at aspects of how do we incorporate this into curriculums? How do we make sure that faculty can serve as clinical ambassadors for infection prevention, make sure they're aware of the CDC core practices for infection prevention and control, which are going to be distributed at the end of today's webinar, and then also make use of free resources like the new Medscape series that just came out to not only educate themselves as faculty experts, but also the students so that we can really move the needle forward. And those core practices focus on leadership support, making sure that the top administration of a facility understands, supports, and resources the infection prevention control program. We've got to start with education, and not just education, but translating that into competency for our healthcare-associated um, infection prevention efforts and the personnel associated with that. Engaging the patient. I want patients to ask me if I've washed my hands. I love it. I think it's amazing when patients ask us these questions. It helps us hold ourselves accountable, and they help us um, be held accountable. And then we talked about performance monitoring. So if we use an ATP measurement or we do bioluminescence, and then I provide that feedback to you as environmental services or nursing, that's data for action. That's th things that we can actually take and use. And it helps us look at basic things like standard precautions or hand hygiene or our uh, cleaning the disinfection and, and something like injection and medication safety, which continues to be a problem. We also want to look at the risk assessment. Um, that makes a big difference so that we can be aware of the risk that we'll face within our current role and how to protect ourselves. And that would really be driven by your infection preventionist so that we can minimize exposures, improve outcome measures, look at our medical equipment to make sure that we're reducing risk for transmission, and also properly apply the transmission-based precautions so that we don't have occupational exposure or the devices themselves um, actually can cause transmission or environmental surfaces. One of the things that I wanted to mention um, is that there's a new Medscape resource available from CDC that's out there for infection prevention and control, and so you can click that link there. All that's required is a free Medscape account, and there's six total modules out there that CDC was kind enough to sponsor with a grant with Medscape, and they're totally free, and so you can earn contact hours associated with that. It's a great way to address the periodic refresher piece that I just mentioned before. So as we conclude, you know, where are we going? Well, we're going to continue to have superbugs. We're going to continue to have challenges, and we're going to continue to have staffing challenges within healthcare. Are we ready to respond? Well, my thing is focus on the positive. Focus on the back to the basics approach. Look at our standard precautions. Look at our cleaning and disinfection, but also bring all the stakeholders together.
and recognize the role of the clinical environment of care in transmission and incorporate those newly published CDC core elements of HEI prevention. This will help us really move forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Garcia from the American Association of Colleges of Nursing to make a few closing comments, and then we'll open it up for question and answer. Dr. Garcia? Thank you, Dr. Garrett, and thank you for your insightful and informative presentation highlighting the fundamental elements for use in the environment of care. The resources that you have presented and shared will empower nurses nationally to enhance their knowledge on minimizing bacterial colonization and transmission through collaborative practice and partnering with our environmental services colleagues. I will now turn it back over to Dr. Garrett for questions and answers. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, it does look like we have several questions. Um, I will try to do my best to answer all. I will tell you if there's any questions we cannot answer um, due to timing, we will commit to getting those answers um, for you. Uh, the first question is, and this is a great one, is for portable blood pressure machines, how often should you clean? Um, this is a question that I would say let's even make it a little bit more broad. So shared medical equipment in general should be clean and disinfected after every single patient use. Um, there are many facilities that also say just as a kind of measure of extra safety, they'll say clean it before and after. Well, when I ask the question, why do you do that, people say, well, I don't really know if the person before actually cleaned it. So I, I, I will give them that. I think that it's always better to be safe than sorry, but the general rule of thumb is shared medical equipment between um, uses does need to be clean and disinfected, and so that will always keep you safe. Uh, one of the biggest areas that we had mentioned before was glucometers because of the risk of blood exposure there, and that applies there as well, and that's certainly a big hot button, especially for CMS and Joint Commission, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, the next question is, do you recommend uh, cleaning and disinfection non-critical reusable equipment after every patient versus should we move to actually disposable um, in the ambulatory setting as well as inpatient? So great question, and I think it's kind of two parts. I, I think the first part I answered before, which was if it's a, a shared piece of medical equipment, you do want to clean and disinfect it between every single use. So that takes care of that. The second, which is a more interesting question, is should we move to all disposable things like blood pressure cuffs? Um, I think there is some strategic value in that um, in the sense that you're not going to share it between patients, but let's use the blood pressure cuff as an example. Most often when I go into ICUs at least, I see that that blood pressure cuff is actually wrapped around the patient's bed rail. Well, we know that the science shows that that's one of the dirtiest areas in the patient environment, and so we're already contaminating that, that disposable non-shared device through the environment through our own practices. So I think it's fine if that's something that cost-wise you can absorb, but you want to make sure that you still store it in a way that's going to prevent contamination. And even if it's, if it's not going to be shared, um, you do want to disinfect it between uses because you don't want to take something from the environment and then apply it to the patient. Um, and I would also add that it's important to consult the manufacturer's instructions for use to make sure that you're compliant with those as well. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, the next question is, is environmental services remove, removes garbage without changing gloves or doing hand hygiene in between rooms. How can we get buy-in? That's an excellent question. Um, first and foremost is that regardless of clinical training or clinical roles, everybody has the same, follow the same rules is, is kind of my motto. Um, hand hygiene applies to all, whether you're a volunteer or your environmental services or the chief medical officer. Um, so they absolutely need to be wearing gloves when they're handling any potentially infectious waste. Um, that's an OSHA requirement. But they also should be performing hand hygiene, and that's a CDC requirement from their guidelines. And so if uh, environmental services are going to come in, then they need to perform hand hygiene, come in, put their gloves on, grab the trash, and then leave and go immediately to the receptacle. Um, and then, of course, remove those gloves and then disinfect this, uh, their hands as well with their um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer or soap and water. So definitely need to make sure that you're doing that. As far as to your point about getting buy-in, I think that's where the collaboration with environmental services leadership comes in. And, you know, if you call your environmental services technician a housekeeper, that just totally changes the conversation versus you're an environmental services technician that plays a role just like my certified nursing assistants or nursing technicians do. And so we want to try to integrate them as much as possible. Um, the next question is, do you have any recommendations to help with education for environmental services personnel for whom English is a second language? Excellent question, um, and one that comes up all the time. Um, I, I will give you kind of a two-part answer. Um, the first is that, you know, if you think about most healthcare facilities, you want to check the job description. 
most facilities do require that all staff that work in the healthcare facility be proficient in English. Um, so proficiency does not mean it's their second language or their, their first language. It just means they're proficient. Um, it would be no different than if I walked into a hotel um, in the United States and I, I tried to be greeted by someone and they spoke in French. Um, I don't speak French. And so we do want to make sure that there's kind of the healthcare jargon that we need to make sure everyone's familiar with. And then also that there's not a language barrier that will inhibit their ability to receive instructions and follow um, our safety principles. And so the other piece to that is we need to ensure that the staff can access the safety data sheet and read it accordingly in order to protect themselves in case there's an occupational exposure. Um, I've seen some really cool practices with facilities that have hired people where English is not their first language, and they've actually provided on-site um, uh, ESL classes to actually help them with that. I've seen facilities that have just not um, hired people uh, and actually done testing before as part of their pre-hire employment test. Um, so there's all different ways to do that, but I would certainly make sure you want to make sure, or I guess, allow for um, different situations that you deal with and, and ensure that everyone can communicate in a fair manner. Um, the next question is, is that uh, regarding ATP, what's the hi. upper limit of acceptable range? I'm sorry? Hi. Hi, this is uh, Ashley Verma. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I'm going to uh, transfer it over to Kate Wiedemann to provide the um, instructions on continuing education. But thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we have lots of questions, and we'll be following up with the participants afterwards. Kate? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Garrett. That was a really wonderful presentation. Um, so before we end today's webinar, I just want to provide some instructions for continuing education. Um, so you must complete the continuing education post-test and evaluation. Please follow the detailed instructions that will appear on the post-meeting webpage right after you close out of the webinar. You must complete and pass the post-test activity at 75% to receive continuing education. For those on the phone who currently aren't logged into ReadyTalk online, to obtain continuing education, please go to www.cdc.gov slash TCE online. The access code for this webinar is NES0821. A follow-up email will also be sent after the webinar with detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation. With that, I'd like to thank our speakers as well as all of you for taking time to join us today and for your commitment to keeping your patients safe. Thank you so much.